In July, you gave an interview to The Guardian where you uh, quoted that Formula One is a crap and that the hybrid engines are a shitty product to sell. Are you still, is that still your opinion? If yes, why? If they were the words I used, yeah. it's true. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Max, no, Max is Max's fault that we've got this engine, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. Not that he knew what engine we'd get. His idea was, which he will explain, an engine that would be good for manufacturers and bring them into Formula One. Yeah. That was the whole idea. And the problem is, as soon as the engineers got hold of these engines, they've done a brilliant job, haven't they? They, they have, unfortunately. I mean, Mr. Mosley, um, directly to that point, you've been the FIA president for a long time. What is your opinion concerning to that? And is the Formula One championship on a bad way? Are the races boring, meanwhile? Well, those are several questions in one. But the, uh, as far as the engine goes, the idea was to have an engine that on, where the research was road relevant rather than racing relevant. So what we've had for a hundred years was trying to get the maximum possible power from a limited capacity. And what I was saying was we need to get the maximum possible power from the minimum amount of fuel. Now that principle, I worked that out actually uh, with um, uh, Professor Gershaw who was then the head of R&D at BMW, who understood much more about the technology than I did. But that was, that was the objective. But of course, it was essential, if you were doing that, to do the engine in a way that an independent engine supplier like Cosworth could do at an economic price. So if I'd been doing the detailed regulations, apart from the principle, I would have gone to Cosworth and said, can you draft some regulations for us to look at where you could follow this principle but produce the engine for a sensible amount of money. What does uh, an engine, engine like this power unit cost in, in, in development and, and in reality? Nobody knows because the manufacturers don't reveal. But the important point is that the research is road relevant. So what they discover for Formula One is going to be directly applicable to the road cars. Road car engines are in the sort of 30% efficiency bracket. The Formula One engines are up in about 40%. And uh, this is extremely important. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that when you buy a liter of fuel, a third of it propels the car, a third of it is lost in heat, and a third of it goes out the exhaust. So if you could start using some of that two thirds so that it's currently wasted, it's enormously beneficial. That was the objective. Mr. Ecclestone, the costs are nearly exploding in Formula One. Some people speak about three to five hundred million investment each year from Mercedes or uh, Ferrari. Um, how to work against it and how to make the smaller teams more competitive? Well, this is something else that Max tried to do, is to have the regulations that it was impossible to spend to achieve a better performance. It doesn't matter how much people spend. What we're concerned with is a team comes in is how much they need to spend to be competitive. And that's the amount that we want reduced. Mr. Mosler, in 2008, you demanded a cost cap for Formula One. Um, would it be still the one and only solution to get back racing on racetracks? I don't think, I think there's another thing you could do but it wouldn't be very popular with the top teams, Ferrari and Mercedes. You give the small teams greater technical freedom in return for operating within a budget. So you say to them, look, if you operate within a budget of, say, 10, 20 times of a GP2 team, you can have a movable wing, you can have different size, you can have all sorts of things. So their cars then become competitive with the cars that are spending three, four hundred million. Then uh, teams could come in, they would be competitive, they would spend a small amount, the big teams would complain, they'd say this is unfair, and we would say no, because if you want to operate for that same budget, you can have the same freedoms. And I think that would solve the problem. And how to convince the bigger teams to go that way? It would be difficult to convince them, but 
in the structure of Formula One, they would be outvoted. If Bernie and Jean Todd got together, they could push that through because some of the teams would be with them, and that would be enough. Mm. And how to convince uh, Jean Todd? <laughs> well, Jean is um, hes a bit different from Max. He's very worried about upsetting people. He wants everyone to be happy, and you know that is impossible. When Max wanted to get something done, if one or two people were unhappy, so that's how it was. In fact, most of the things that were introduced, forget costs, all the other things. If you said to the teams, at the time they all complained, and if you said to them, let's put them all back again, they said, absolutely no way. You know, things that they'd really violently objected to, they wouldn't want to bring them back. I'll give you an example. Yeah, I'll give yeah. you an example. The qualifying cars. Back in 2002, they used to make a special car <laughs> uh, for practice. It had virtually no cooling. It had an engine that lasted 50 kilometers. This was to get the best position on the grid. Then they completely rebuilt it overnight. And I said to the teams, why don't you just qualify the car you race? So they said, no, no, it's impossible, it'll be dangerous, and so on. So I said, well, after long discussion, <coughs> we will, um, there's a rule that says we can put the cars in Parc Fermé after qualifying. And so we're going to put them in Parc Fermé after qualifying. We won't let them out until the race. So if you want to use a qualifying car, you can, but of course it won't be much good in the race. And huge row, protests, even arbitration sort, but at the end, agreement was reached and now you wouldn't find anyone in the paddock who would want to use a qualifying car. You remember <coughs> Ken Terrell said a lot of people are going to get killed because the cars won't be prepared properly. You're going to kill the drivers. And you're only going to get half the cars finish the races. And interestingly that season where we introduced it that was the first time for 40 years, 50 years even, where uh, all the cars finished. The last yeah. time was in the 60s and now suddenly all the cars finished 40 years later. So lots of things that sound difficult or stupid. <coughs> it's because the people don't really <coughs> think them through. You know, as soon as you want to introduce something, they think, ah, that's not good for me. They don't really know why, but they think it, they're in good shape. Anything you propose to Mercedes at the moment, and probably if I went to Mercedes, it'd be the same. I'd say, that's bad. Because what I've got is good, so I don't want to take any risks and change. Is the problem that way that there are too many egos in Formula One and not thinking in general, all the teams? Well, not so much egos. I mean, these guys want to win. And they don't want anybody to... And they don't care if other people don't win. And if you're winning, nobody, you don't want to change things. Yeah. It's just that simple. And like Red Bull. Why should they change? But no, they have bad cards at the moment. Yes. Um, what would you change, Mr. Mosley, um, else perhaps? Uh, redistribution of TV money or, uh, for equal opportunities? Well, uh, <laughs> if it were me, I would say there's two sources of money in Formula One. The sponsorship, over which you have no control, And there's the FOM money, the money that Bernie did, distributes, which you, over which you do have control. So if it were me, I would split it equally. Now, Bernie has always been against that, saying that's communism, which in a way it is. But if you have a sport, it's good to start with a level playing field. And you would have a, a financial level playing field if you did that. But the big team's absolutely against that because they, they say, look, you know, if I'm a film star, I get paid more than the extra. That's right. What is your opinion to that? Is it possible to, to uh, change the system of um, spreading the money? If everybody agrees, yes. Yeah. Uh, no, but you wouldn't agree <laughs> to give less money, take less money and give it to another team if it was a team owner. So that it's, I'd say, impossible. Mm. Unless there's a rule somewhere where it's anti-competitive. Which, which um, I understand some of the teams are complaining to the European Commission and, and saying what I've just said, it's anti-competitive. But there are lots of other things that are anti-competitive for the teams in Formula One. 
So they've got a lot more complaints than just the amount of money. And if they got all of them, as Max said, more or less a level playing, there should be no complaints. They all then could do the same thing. As the ones with that two really dominant en engine manufacturers at the moment in Formula One and they have a lot of power or influence. Um, if one of them would quit, Ferrari or Mercedes, um, the Formula One could break down. So the Formula One needs more strong engine supplies. How <coughs> could there be an incentive for manufacturers to take part in a multi-million pound or dollar or euro project? Well, I, I mean the, the difficulty is that you have to have an independent engine supplier and the great uh, who can do so on a commercial basis. And the great strength of Formula One from the late 60s until quite recently was that we had Cosworth, Mechachrome, other people making engines, and so you weren't in the hands of the manufacturers. The moment you have uh, one or two or even three manufacturers and they're involved at board level, so that Mr. Zecher can talk to Mr. Marcioni or Mr. Gowan, then uh, they control Formula One. You don't control Formula One. And at that point, the need for an independent red engine supplier becomes acute. But Max, if we started an engine shop, the last thing you'd want to build is this engine. Well, Because you couldn't sell it. No, but you, it, you couldn't sell it if you were competing with Mercedes with an unlimited yeah. research budget. Yeah. But on the other hand, if you designed the engine or you've restricted the engine in a way that you could produce it economically, and uh, then Mercedes could do what they liked because uh, just like in the old days with the old um, ordinary engines, manufacturers could come in, but they couldn't dominate. I mean, when we got rid of the V8s, V6s, they were all, whatever you spent, you couldn't get any more power. That was it. People had exhausted all the possibilities. And since then, with this new engine, the, I suppose the people that have spent the most money can get a big advantage. Because if they make mistakes, they can you know, make all the changes necessary. Mm. I heard of Just, just one example that Mercedes, if they, if they, uh, if there is a construction of a single part which is uh, on carbon or, or something like that, uh, they throw it away as long as they have the right components. So it costs millions. So is it possible to, to, uh, to, to cap it or to, to make with it such a budget limit to, to quit that? Because all the others don't have a chance to do that. They have to take what they get and, and that's it. Now this is what Max said. Yeah. You know, Max wanted to put, I argued with him at the mm. time, because he wanted to put a limit of uh, 40 million, which in the meantime is a hell of a lot of money. Mm. But anyway, I said that's never going to work because the people that are spending 300 million aren't going to be happy. Why don't we say 200 million and the one spending three will find a way and it won't affect the other people. And eventually the 200 million would come down to something sensible. Except I think what Max did f frightened a lot of people away and said it's a crazy idea. It wasn't crazy in my opinion, it was the amount. But you know we discussed this. But Max said, well, they can do it if they want to. That's the difference. The idea was good and if people had to be honest, they could have done it. Unfortunately, uh, they didn't want, to, didn't suit them. So you, you always get them, the big companies, you know, people like Ferrari, say, if you do that, we'll quit Formula One. And what you have to do, you have to be prepared to call their bluff. Or, for example, <coughs> at the end of my time, they were saying we'll f run a rival series. Now, for reasons I could explain, it's impossible to run a rival series. It's not like tennis or boxing where you just need a, a ring or court. But uh, you have to be prepared to call their bluff and tell them if you want to go, don't slam the door behind you. And you know that they'll still be there next season. But it, it does mean a period of disagreeable relations. Yeah, but anyway, Max, assume they did go whoever. We used to have one manufacturer called Ferrari. 
Yeah. And all the rest were racing teams. Yeah. And this is probably where Formula One was built. It's all built on Ferrari. No, it wasn't built on Ferrari because Ferrari didn't win many championships. Yeah. It was not built on Ferrari. If you think back to, for example, 1969, before we started March in 1970, there were some races, there were 13 cars on the grid. And they were not competitive in any way because Ferrari finished joint fifth out of the six teams. So they finished at the bottom of the what was then the Constructors' Championship. And when we came in with no money, no resources, but a couple of good drivers in 1970, we had the front row of the grid, effectively. We had pole position and next to pole with Jackie Stewart and Chris Amon. The Formula One was like nothing in those days. Ferrari was sort of messing around at the back. So uh, the, the Formula One was built on people like Frank Williams, who had an independent engine supplier in Cosworth. They could make the car themselves, or Ken Tyrrell, same thing. And then Ferrari then came and raced with them, sometimes successfully, sometimes unsuccessfully. But I think if you said, what's the one factor that built Formula One into what it is now over those 40, 50 years, apart from Bernie's effort, it would be the Cosworth engine. And Mr. Ferrari wasn't a big spender. No, he, he understood about money. <laughs> he didn't spend. He spent what was necessary for his engineers, but he wasn't a big spender. Bernie once asked him, why he'd hired a particular person to run the team, and Ferrari's answer was he's cheap. Yes. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> Mr. Eccleston, a lot of people don't understand the rules of F1 anymore. They say it's too complicated. Um, is that the reason why the TV quotas went down? Um, also the number of visitors at the racetracks. If, if the example Silverstone or Monza are bad, but at other racetracks you can see them. Um, not so many spectators anymore. Well, I mean, if, really, why did Formula One become as powerful and as strong as it was? Is because we decided and we had good television in from the start. Um, and now the, there wasn't much else to watch. Now, if you look now on a Sunday afternoon, there's a million different things for people to watch. They all, everybody walks around with what you've got. So we never really honestly know if the viewership has gone down. We're trying to find out now because it may have gone down on the free-to-air television and the only people that can give, re or I don't know how they can, but they give reasonably accurate results because they've got no reason not to. But how many people watch on these things? You can't control it, yeah. We have no idea. So I think we've probably got a lot more viewers in Formula One than we've ever had. A lot more. But I also speak to, to people in my surrounding, that from hand workers to um, doctors, and they say, ah, oh, yeah, in Shumi times we, we watched it. And now we don't understand anymore what, what it is. I understand very well. Yeah. Um, most people who get involved in any sport like to think that they understand it a little bit, and then they predict, like we've just had the Rugby World Cup in England. So people that follow rugby, which nobody used to, but now there's more people following, <coughs> wouldn't have a good idea of what team is going to have a big advantage and win more. Today, I'll have a small wager with anybody and bet who's going to win the race in Austin and be second mm. and maybe third. Yeah. You don't want to go to a race and know that. You want to go, you go... With me in the car, you're thinking Sebastian's going to win, I think Nico's going to ring or something. It's not like that now. We know who's going to win, who's going to be second and third and fourth. So you've lost that. And you've, I'm sorry to come back at it. You've lost the excitement. And again, it was pointed out to me with some Russian people, the noise of Formula One, how it used to be. You know, the thrill of the start. Max doesn't agree with that. <laughs> I don't entirely agree. <coughs> I don't entirely agree about the noise because mainly because I'm deaf now from the noise. But that's apart from it. <laughs> that's but, but apart from that, uh, I think the people watching on television are not really conscious of the noise. But it's just my point. But I, I think the, the the fundamental thing is that a lot of the technology now is so complex that nobody understands it. I'll give you an example. 
If, if you can look on the internet, you can see a picture of a modern Formula One steering wheel with all the buttons and so on. Now, I've followed it pretty much for the last 40, 50 years. I could not tell you what most of those buttons and things are for. And <coughs> we brought in a rule saying driver aids are prohibited, meaning the driver had to drive the car, not a computer. And it's a constant battle to stop the computer taking more and more of the functions. So I think there's a big argument for more back to basics, where the driver's got a steering wheel, maybe even a gear lever, and brakes and an accelerator, and a very powerful engine, and he has to get on with it. This is the reason when people say to me, who do I think was the best driver? And the name I come up with, most people don't agree with me. I say Alan Prost. Because Prost had to look after his brakes, the gearbox, everything. And he did a good job. So he finished more races and he finished in a better position. Whereas today, they don't have their brain. I mean, they sit there on the starting grid, and there's an engineer that starts the race. It's just not on. As Max said, it should be when the lights go off, they're on their own. They don't need somebody to tell them, ah, yes, but so your co-driver's using this, whatever, through this corner or doing that, whatever. Yeah. Just not on. So the intelligence was in the car, not on the pit See? wall. It's, a, it's an engineer's championship, more or less. I'm not saying that Lewis isn't a super driver, but he's getting a hell of a lot of help. I'd like to see him in a GP2 car with the GP2 drivers. Mm. Must we? I'm not saying he wouldn't win, but it would be interesting. When they um, very recently brought in a rule saying that the engineers could no longer set up the whole start procedure, it was uproar with the Formula One drivers. And the race director, when they started complaining, said, well, look, if you can't manage it, why don't we replace all of you with the GP2 drivers? Because they have to start just with an ordinary clutch. And I mean, that's really the bottom line. And of course, it's, it, 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 it's supposed to be a double competition, men and machines. But if the engineering competition starts to take over from the human competition, Formula One, in my opinion, at least, loses an essential element. But how to change it? Just <laughs> rules. rules just yeah. Tear the rule book up, yeah. get a few competent people together, mm -hmm. and say, let's rewrite Formula One regulations. Is it that what happens in 2017? The new rules are changing to the better? I think you'll find there's a, already a rule we brought in in 1994, very simple, it says driver aids are prohibited. And the teams agreed to that at the time because they said, oh, you can never define what a driver aid is. And they forgot that if, if you're the regulator, a driver aid's whatever you say it is. So you have the possibility of eliminating almost all these outside helps from the engineers, the radio, the uh, computer control and so on by enforcing rigorously that rule. But uh, you can't do that without upsetting people. Mm. There are <coughs> rule changes in 2017, I heard. But what exactly will it be? And um, is it good for the spectators? Will it improve the show? Well, I, like, I, I sit on this strategy group. I'd like to know what they're going to be. And what they want to be? They like all the other rules. It's like an old Victorian house that people keep doing things to it. Needs pulling down and restarting again. Okay. You can't cross this line and add that, cross this out, put that in place of that. It's not what you want. So what would you do in that group to convince them? <laughs> well, uh, I'd give it a certain amount of thought, but off the top of my head, I would first of all want the cars changed so that the driver had to take complete control of the car including the gearbox, and I would even insist on gear changes and because that's part of racing. And at the same time, I would bring in regulations about the cost that would mean that all the teams could spend the same amount so, and couldn't spend more, so that the cleverest engineer would make the best car, not the richest engineer. combination of those two things, I think, would, would make a radical difference. But It's something that, if, if I was still in charge, I'd want to listen to people's views, talk about it, think about it. But that's just a, off the top of my head 
reaction. What would you change, Mr. Eggleston? I mean, we mustn't forget that we're in the entertainment business. So we ought to have rules that the public want, really. We should be asking the public, what do you not like about Formula One today? Mm -hmm. And what did you like about Formula One before? And people say, ah, Eccleston, you're getting too old. You know, the young kids today are uh, a bit different. And they all watch the ra even, which is a difference and, and maybe not good, where they don't need to watch Tedder. They can do whatever they're doing and still watch the race on their laptops. Um, so it's, we have to have a complete rethink. Um, is it maybe are the, 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 um, the, the tickets for a Formula One race um, too, too high or uh, too expensive for a, for a family, for a young family to watch uh, the, the race at the racetrack? Um, I don't know where, I, I'm quite sure that if the tickets were much cheaper, there'd be more viewers go to the circuit, for sure. Now, the problem is the guy that runs the race is the promoter, has to generate enough money to pay us because we have to pay 65% of whatever money we generate anywhere to the teams. So if we could adopt what Max wanted to adopt, they wouldn't need so much money. We could do a much better deal with the promoters. They would be paying us a lot less and the ticket prices would fall. In the end, the bottom line is that the teams, the top teams, are spending far too much money. And ultimately that money comes from the public, whether through their sponsors or whether from the ticket prices via Bernie or whatever. So if you, as Bernie says, reduce the cost of the top teams and everything else would get much cheaper. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't notice any difference watching it from the grandstand or on the television. If the teams are spending 40 million rather than 300 million, you would not see any difference. Now, if you were winning to the grandstand at the next race in Austin, ask the public, what's the capacity of the engines? How many cylinders? How much power? What's to, how much fuel do they use? They wouldn't be able to answer any of those questions. And you could probably even answer a lot of the people that are currently involved in Formula One, and they wouldn't know either. And don't care either. Yeah, for me, it's also under, uh, not not understandable the rules because um, if if I see a, a, a FIA uh, a bulletin and there is written that Mr. Alonso has to go 45 uh, places back because uh, this is uh, the power unit uh, part one, two, and three, and so he has to go back for for 40, 45 places. It's uh, nobody understands that. Uh, and the people from uh, Honda spoke to me over the weekend. They said we're trying another engine because they can change as many engines as they like. They said, we can't go any farther back on the grid. <laughs> you know, we're, we're there anyway, so what the hell? Yeah. That's right. Uh, Mr. Eggerson, may I uh, also ask um, 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 three questions about the selling of the Formula One? Is that okay? Um, now the F1 will be sold. Is it a question of high interest of the new owner or a lower interest of the old one? No, I mean, <coughs> the people that have the control in shares are in a company that uses other people's money and they have to after a certain period return that money not actually physically return it so we reinvest it in something else uh, doesn't matter how good the original investment was that's how it is Maybe those are the rules that should be torn up as well. But anyway, um, so CVC are in a position where they wouldn't need and will have to sell a bit past their sell-off date, actually. And there's three types of people that want to buy. It's just a case of now getting together now and sorting out all the details. What will change with a new owner? We don't know. No idea. No idea? But uh, will you still be the CEO? We don't. I mean, they've asked me if I would stay on. 
The answer is yes, but they may decide they don't want me to later on. Who knows? Good. Thank you very much.